Awesome. Yeah, I don't know. I was having issues with my computer for some reason, so I'm going to be on my phone. Uh, but my name is Justin, and I am an alcoholic. Hello. Um, and if the camera is, like, too annoying for you guys, I'll just turn it off, and I'll just speak on audio. Um, I don't know why my computer wasn't working with Zoom, but we're just going to be doing it on my phone. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to get into my story. Um, my name is Justin. I'm an alcoholic. Um, my sobriety date is August 24th of 2021. By the grace of God, I'll have six months next week. Um, and I'm not a first time winner. I have been trying to get sober since I was uh, 20. I'm now 24. So as you can see, it's been about four years and I only have uh, shy of six months. Um, but this time around, I've been working really hard and have definitely been having a spiritual experience uh, as a result of the steps and just really throwing myself into this program. Uh, I'm speaking like three or four times a week. I spoke last night. I might be speaking tomorrow, um, making amends right now, just really doing you know everything I can to stay sober, but also to uh, you know live a spiritual life and get closer to um, a God of my understanding. Um, so the way that I think most of AA does it and the way that I usually do it is we talk about um, what it was like, what happened and what it's like now. Um, so qualify a little bit. Um, started drinking and using drugs when I was about 12 or 13. Um, I was a blackout drinker immediately. Uh, first time I drank, I blacked out and I walked about five miles in a snowstorm to my friend's house and don't even remember walking home. Um, but that kind of kicked off about 10 or so years of, uh, drinking. I talk about drugs a little bit too. If you guys don't want me to just stop me. Um, but definitely a lot of drugs in my story and, uh, pills and all that stuff. Um, so I'm from Scotch Plains, New Jersey, uh, born and raised here. Um, I went to high school in Scotch Plains. Um, and yeah, I was, uh, very different than my peers um all of us like to party but you know most of my friends would drink and then they would go home and they'd like sleep in their nice beds at the end of the night i was usually in a cop car or an ambulance by the end of the night or i was being picked up by my parents um because i like fell off of a roof or something like that um and what's different about me is that when i put drinking when i put drinks and drugs into my body uh my body says more um and, you know, I have plenty of friends that drink quite heavily, uh, but they are able to go home at the end of the night and not have any financial or legal repercussions like I have had plenty of in my life. Um, but uh, like I said, uh, not a first time winner. Um, I'm going to try my best to kind of keep the timeline on track. I like to talk a lot. and I like to jump all over the place. Um, but I... So I'm from Scotch Plains, New Jersey, started drinking when I was 13 um, and pretty much had a thousand blackouts while I was in high school. Uh, you know, I loved the party. Everything was about the party. Um, and uh, I just kept blacking out, you know, normal people, they would drink and they'd be fine. For me, it was always a blackout um, every single time. And my alcoholism works that I don't drink every single day, you know. I got to the point where I was drinking every single day, but when I do drink, um, it is always, there's no end to it is basically what happens. And, you know, people are going home at the end of the night. I'm going back out and I'm trying to find more liquor. I'm digging around my house, trying to find more liquor. Um, and that's just the way it is for me. Um, but basically, uh, so I went through high school, somehow graduated. Um, and, just kind of lived for the party. I didn't really care about school, didn't really care about, uh, you know, making a bunch of friends or anything like that. I was mainly trying to get into parties and uh, hanging out with people who I knew would drink like I did. And I would find the biggest drug addicts, the biggest drinkers, and I would hang out with them and I would associate with them. And that was just kind of the way it went. Um, my drinking really took off once I went to college. Uh, I went to Penn State uh, three days after I graduated from high school. So it was kind of like, you know, got my high school diploma somehow. And then I went right to Penn State. 
Um, and within two or three nights of being at Penn State, uh, I got arrested for underage drinking. Um, and I was basically doing some illegal stuff with my friends and the cops showed up. All my friends decided to stay there with the cops. Me being a blackout person, I decided to run from the cops and I got tackled. Uh, being a wrestler growing up, I tried to wrestle the cop off of me and I almost got tased, but it took me three days at uh, Penn State to get my first underage drinking charge. Um, and that was then followed by about a year or so more uh, of progressive drinking um, and drug use that just got progressively worse. You know, I was trying new drugs that I never tried before and just going off to the races with those. Um, and within the course of about a year and a half, I got arrested four more times for underage drinking. Uh, I proceeded to destroy about half of my body uh, physically from blackout injuries. My leg has scars on it that I'm never gonna get rid of. My hand is, uh, I got a pretty gnarly scar that I'm never gonna get rid of. Um, and I smashed this entire side of my face. Um, and that was my big final hurrah. That was after three uh, arrests. My fourth arrest was, I don't even remember how, I was at a party one minute, the next minute I'm in a hotel room with my dad who lives four hours away uh, and my complete side of my face is smashed up and I almost went blind in this eye from my drinking uh, and smashing my face while I was blacked out. I don't remember doing it uh, or what happened and no one else seemed to know. I didn't even really talk to anybody about it, but I left Penn State uh, on against my will because my will was to uh, keep going back and keep going back to that party. Didn't matter if I got suspended, arrested. I just wanted to be there drinking and doing drugs the way I wanted to do it. Um, and it, it was like, I had blinders on, you know, all the legal trouble, all the physical pain, all the friendships I destroyed. It didn't matter. Everything was about drinking and drugging. That was all I cared about. Um, and so I got expelled from Penn state, uh, about a year and some change after I got admitted into Penn State. Um, and, you know, I didn't see a problem. You know, my friends who drank, like their whole life was about drinking. They saw the problem with me. They were having interventions with me. Every My friends that were drug dealers, people that were, you know, the biggest drug dealers at Penn State I was hanging around with, they were coming to me and they were saying, hey, man, you got a problem. Um, and I was the only one who didn't see it. Um, and, uh, you know, it didn't stop after I got expelled. Uh, in fact, it actually got worse after I got expelled. Um, but getting expelled allowed me to enter into my first IOP against my will. Um, but that was my first introduction into recovery. And at the time, um, I really did not. And sorry, I'm just going to keep an eye on the time because I don't want to speak. Sometimes I just speak forever. Oh, I think I just screwed up. Okay. Um, and, uh, so I got my first introduction into recovery after I got kicked out of Penn state. Um, and I wanted nothing to do with it. <laughs> my family sent me against my will and me being such a good manipulator, such a good, uh, basically just good at getting to that pill, getting to that drink. I manipulated my way through there. Uh, I sweet talked everybody. Uh, I got released early. Um, on good behavior or whatever you want to call it. And I went right back to doing what I was doing before uh, because my whole life goal was to get messed up as much as I could, as often as I could and drink as much as I possibly could. Didn't matter what relationships I was destroying. Didn't matter what financial situations I was having. Didn't matter what physical uh, injuries I was getting on my body. What mattered was me getting out of this mind and into some blacked out state where I don't remember anything anymore. And that was the way that I was. Um, but after I left Penn State, I did the IOP for a little bit. Like I said, didn't take it seriously. People in there were like 20 years, 30 years older than me. Uh, they were telling me that, you know, you're so young, you need to get this young. And I was like, yeah, I don't care. You know, like all I care about is getting drunk. Um, but after I, you know, graduated from, IOP with flying colors, I went back to drinking even harder than I did before. Um, and now this is when I turned 21 and I'm able to go to bars. I'm able to drink like an adult. 
Uh, and this is when things started getting more dangerous because now I'm drinking and driving. And I was thinking about it tonight. You know, I was talking to a guy at a meeting that I was just at, and he was like, like my drinking was dangerous. He was like, my drinking was like life or death and not just for me, it was for other people. And that made me think about myself uh, because of the times that I would drink and drive and drive up really far distances. Like I'd drive down the shore drunk and back up drunk, you know? Uh, I should be dead and a lot of other people probably should be dead because of my drinking and driving. Um, but it didn't really matter to me. You know, all that mattered, like I said, was uh, getting drunk or getting as messed up as I possibly could. Um, but, you know, so basically uh, I went on that little bender after I got out of IOP for about maybe a little less than a year. Uh, and that's when I really started having issues with my parents. Uh, and they basically gave me an ultimatum. They said, we're going to send you to a rehab in Florida like a real live-in rehab, or you can try to go to an AA meeting. And at this point in my life, I was like, screw that. I don't want to go to Florida. So I was like, I'm going to go to an AA meeting. And that's when I went to my first AA meeting in Summit, New Jersey. Uh, if anybody's from the New Jersey area, Summit has a million meetings and it's a great place to, you know, find a bunch of old timers and find some good young friends that, you know, will help you on this journey. Um, but basically I went to my first meeting uh, I was just doing it to appease my parents. I didn't want to be there. Um, I didn't know what AA was really. And the meeting was downstairs. I took my butt upstairs and I hung out upstairs for about 10 minutes, uh, because I didn't want to go into that meeting. Um, and something just kind of told me I went upstairs and I saw an empty cathedral and I just had something come over me that was just like, dude, like, you've been through so much and you're still BSing this, like just go into that meeting. Even if it's like stupid, just go into that meeting and sit down. Uh, and that's what I did. You know, I walked in 20 minutes late. I think I was probably still high at the time. Um, but I sat in the back. I didn't raise my hand or say anything, but I heard a lot of people sharing things that I related with people that were blackout drinkers, people that their whole life revolved around the drink and the drug. That was just, me you know and I've never ever heard other people like me I've been surrounded by other people that maybe they drank and they drugged a lot but they didn't have the repercussions and that mental obsession that I had to constantly uh need to drink or drug um and so I decided you know I don't want to go to Florida let me try to give a a little bit of a shot and I was lucky enough to meet a young person who sent me to a young person's group uh, where I met a bunch of other young people. And that began me getting my first sponsor, me starting to work the steps and me uh, really giving AA somewhat of a shot, you know, as much of a shot at the time that I was willing to give it. Um, but the issue was on my fourth and fifth step, there were certain things that my sponsor looked at me and he said, is there anything you're leaving out? And my mind said, yes, tell him these things. But my mouth said nothing. And I left out those deep, dark secrets uh, that I didn't want to tell anybody, the things that I was bringing to my grave. Um, and, you know, those things that I was keeping in are the things that brought me back out. Um, and it was an inability for me to get honest. I know, like we like to say in the program, like anybody can get the program if they're willing to be honest. I wasn't willing to be fully honest. Um, and so I did the steps in a self-will kind of way, um, and basically relapsed about three times, came back after a week and then had my big relapse, which I went out for pretty much all of COVID up until August of last year. Um, and I proceeded to pretty quickly run my life into the ground. Um, and that was because I was unwilling to lose that ego, lose that pride, lose that fear that I had with those couple things that I was not willing to get honest with another human being about. Um, because I was so arrogant, because I was so prideful, because I was so fearful, I winded up having to learn yet another lesson the hard way. Um, and I got to a point where like, I'm sure people didn't really think I was coming back to AA. I was out for a year and a half. Um, you know, and I decided to make a very impulsive alcoholic decision and moved down to South Jersey. 
uh, get away from my friends, get away from my family, get away from my business life, get away from AA more specifically, and just kind of hide uh, and do all the drinking and the drugs that I wanted to do. Um, and that brought me to my spiritual bottom pretty quickly. I had a financial bottom. I had physical bottom. I wasn't sleeping, but I got to a point where the drinking and the drugs stopped working. And now I don't have that escape anymore, that escape to escape the way I feel because the drinking and the drugs stopped working for me. And I had nothing to do. You know, it was either I would kill myself or something would happen. I didn't know what, but I couldn't take living like that anymore. And that's kind of where divine intervention happened. You know, like when I first came into AA, they planted this seed in my head that, hey, maybe there is a God. Uh, maybe God can help you. And me being such a analytical person, such a hard headed person, I didn't want anything to do with that. But I was at a point now where I was so spiritually bankrupt that I had no other option. Um, so I started looking outside of myself for answers as to what can I do about this issue that I'm having? What can I do about this disease that's on my mind and the drugs and the drinking don't work anymore. And now I'm just depressed and it's not working for me anymore. And I feel like I don't want to live anymore. And, you know, a, a voice within me came and basically was just telling me that I already knew what I had to do. I had to stop living life on self-will. I had to stop living life hiding in this corner in New Jersey where nobody can see me and I can do all the drinking and the drugs I want to do. And I had to go back to my program. I had to go back to AA. I didn't want to do it. You know, I didn't want to, like, I was like, screw that. But I was in enough pain that I knew the only option was to go back into AA. Because at this point, it was no longer about getting to the drink or the drugs. This it became maintenance. And then it became hell is basically what I would say. Um, but what I realized is when I listened to that voice or whatever you want to call it, that told me go back to AA. It was right. And I went back to AA and started having, uh, you know, basically came in with my tail kind of between my legs. And he was like, hey, I'm back, you know, day one, uh, you know, had a really rough time out there. And I knew two things that A, uh, I had a very big ego and B, I had a very small God. And um, you know, I think those two facts, having that in my mind this time, helped me to grow a connection with my higher power that I never had before. Um, and, you know, I started working the steps. I got back with my sponsor and I just started doing things I wasn't doing before. I was calling people. I still call people. Um, I was reading 84 to 88 every single day. I started taking nightly inventory, all those things that I just kind of ignored before I actually started taking seriously, no relationships in the first year, you know, all these things that I didn't want to do anymore that I didn't want to do before I took seriously this time because I was in enough pain this time to actually do it. Um, and you know, working the steps, I spent a lot of time on step one. I did like, I feel like in the past, I kind of just breezed over step one. I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm an alcoholic, like whatever. I did a full first step packet this time. Uh, I sat down with my sponsor and we really looked over everything. And I really got to see right in my face, just how unmanageable my life is when I'm drinking and I'm drugging. Um, and, you know, that was a big eye opener for me because I realized at that point, I have this disease. It's not like I can drink successfully at any point in my life because it's the same result every single time I run my life into the ground. I run my mental state into the ground. I isolate from all my friends. I lose all my money. I physically damage myself every single time. And this has been going on for the past 12 years. You know, it hasn't stopped since I picked up that first drink when I was 13 years old, my math sucks, but, um, you get the point. Um, and I just want to make sure I don't, kind of go over my speaking time here because I'm I, I do that a lot um but I don't know I had to get to that point where I couldn't take it anymore and that was just my experience I know some people I see my friends come in and I don't know what their full story is but it seems like they can kind of get it a little quicker than me I'm so arrogant I'm so self-willed that I still today try to run my show uh and it never goes right when I'm not listening to what my higher power is trying to tell me. And, 
you know, I'm learning today that I need to listen to my sponsor. I need to listen to my intuition uh, because my mind is wrong. My mind is the problem. My mind has all these genius ideas of let me go do this thing. Let me go do that thing. Let me go there. Let me go hang out with this person. And it's never a good idea because my mind wants to kill me. It wants me dead. Um, and, uh, okay. Um, and, you know, I've been blessed, I think, this time around because God has just really shown up for me. And uh, I was never really someone to believe in God. I was never really someone that liked the idea of God. Uh, I actually resented God. He's usually like one of the first things on my resentment list when I do a fourth step. Um, but, you know, I'm not afraid to talk about it today because I've had a spiritual experience. Um, and, you know, today I feel the peace, you know, after doing a fifth step, I'm doing my ninth step. Like I feel like, really good about what I'm doing in this program for the first time in my life I really feel good about something and I just want to share it with other people you know I'm doing a bunch of speaking commitments because I know that that's what I should be doing I shouldn't be going and watching YouTube videos for 15 hours every night like I should be doing what I should be doing um but yeah I think the number one thing that's really helped me this time and I'll kind of just close with this because I know I'm getting kind of past my time um is really working each step individually, not just like skipping over like step two is like whatever, step three is like whatever, you know, step one's whatever. Like I need to really sit down and look at each step and see what it's trying to teach me. And what I realize is that my spiritual growth actually feels like I'm taking steps uh, when I actually take it seriously. When I'm just messing around and I'm bullshitting and I'm like, this doesn't work, it doesn't work. But if I really take it seriously, I feel each step and I feel those character defects get removed from me and I feel more peace with each step I take. Uh, and I feel now today that I can help people and people call me and they're like, man, like you spoke last night and you really helped me. And that feels really good because, you know, I never really had a purpose or an ability to help people in any way. You know, it was all about just getting drunk and high all the time. Um, but yeah, I'll kind of just close with that. Um, hopefully I didn't go over too much, but Thank you for letting me share.